Hello, productivity prodigies. Welcome to another life hack video. Today, we're diving into a really spicy question. How do you put your priorities first when they clash with your manager's priorities? Now, if you're a manager, I can see that look of shock and disbelief on your face. I mean, you're thinking, why would my priorities ever clash with my teams? I mean, we're all working towards the same goal, right? Hold your horses. As life hackers, we're looking at the big picture. We're aiming to get one thing done every week that makes everything else easier in the future. That's classic leverage and it leads to life getting exponentially better. But managers have the opposite pressure. They take a lot of heat to hit short-term deadlines and because of that, they get sucked into sacrificing leverage at the altar of short-term results. That's the classic productivity death spiral and it leads to life getting exponentially worse for everyone on the team. So if you're working underneath that type of manager, how do you thread that needle? How can you be that sneaky productivity ninja doing things that make everyone's life easier, but also hit those short-term deadlines and please your manager? I'll bet they didn't cover that in orientation, did they? Okay, here's the deal. If you're even asking this question, you're probably somewhere inside that productivity death spiral, which means you don't have enough time during the week to get your leveraged work done and meet your manager's short-term expectations. So here's what you might wanna consider front load an investment of time to set up the systems and automations and systems that will save you time in the long run. So essentially planting a productivity tree this week that you can bask in the shade of every week in the future. Now, I know that means you'll probably work some nights or weekends because you have to make that time up somewhere. But before you start becoming an overachiever and working all hours of day and night, slow down for a second because that is very dangerous. If you start cranking out work like a caffeinated squirrel, your boss is gonna think that's your normal pace and that sets you up for a conflict by setting unrealistic expectations for your future work product. So here's the rule of thumb. Any after hours or weekend work should never be meeting deadlines or doing shallow work. Instead, if you're gonna do extra credit time, use it to create a better workflow. My client Safta spent five hours one Saturday figuring out how to automate a report that was taking her 10 hours a month. So now she's getting those 10 hours a month back for infinity. Now in chapter five of our book, Winning the Week, we talk about the concept of leverage, how to identify your leverage priority and how to defend it. So check out our book if you want a deeper dive on that. So just to repeat, any extra credit time you put in is spent creating a system that massively benefits not only you, but also ultimately your boss and your coworkers. That's the right way to thread the needle. Your quality of life goes through the roof and your boss doesn't morph into a, a crazy expectation monster. Okay, here's tip number two. Get 1% better every day. Now, listen, I, I know Rome wasn't built in a day and maybe you don't have a big fat chunk of time right now to improve your systems. All good, because there is a slow and steady route too. This technique is called the 1% rule or the principle of marginal gains. So imagine a snowball rolling down a hill. Starts small, rolls and picks up more snow, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the same thing happens when you continuously make small, leveraged improvements in any area of your life or any area of your work. Because leverage exists in all shapes and sizes, so even tiny leverage improvements can still compound into big results. Here's a quick example. My client Mark is a writer and he typically spends half his day trolling through search engines and organizing findings into something he can actually use. It's tedious and it's time consuming. So here's how he put the 1% rule to work. Instead of overhauling his entire research process in one fell swoop, which he didn't have time for, he started with one small change, organizing his research documents in a more systematic way so he could access them more easily in the future. Now, that took a couple hours and seems insignificant, but saves him a couple hours every week. Now, then he decided to standardize his note-taking process in, on a different week. So again, small change, but over time, helping him locate important details faster. Then in another week, he implemented a software tool for sourcing references. Boom, another tiny leverage improvement that saves him even more time. So he kept going like this day after day and soon enough, significantly reduced his research time and upped his writing output. So like that snowball getting bigger and bigger as it rolls down the hill, these tiny daily improvements compound into massive productivity gains. And that my friends is the power of the 1% rule. Okay, finally, you need to masterfully manage the illusion of capacity. So here's the funny truth. The idea that anyone can know what your work capacity is, is an illusion. I mean, how does your boss even know what you're working on? Or if you're ahead or behind on something? I mean, crap, you don't even know with great certainty what you can or can't do in a month. So how could your boss know? They don't know. 
So they have to use rough indicators to get a rough idea. And you have to manage those indicators to set their expectations to your preferred reality. So here's an example. My client, Tim, works for an IT company that is massive. Now, Tim's boss, let's call him Manager Mike, has absolutely no idea what's going on in Tim's world. Mike's only indicators are Tim's deliverables, the speed of their completion, and the quality of the end product. That's it. So when Tim finishes a big report way ahead of schedule, does he sprint down the hallway and slide it onto Mike's desk and just shout Eureka? No way, because Tim knows the game. He keeps that report in his drawer, cool as a cucumber, and meanwhile uses that extra time to do even more leveraged work. And in this case, Tim built a bot that auto-generates certain sections of his reports, giving him yet another five hours a month. Now, here's another thing he does with that extra time. He's got a running time bank where he tracks overtime and after hours work. So if he goes over one week, he takes it out of his time bank the next week. So when that report deadline rolls around, Tim hands it in right on time, no sooner, no later. Now, Mike is none the wiser, still impressed by Tim's quality, consistent work. And Tim keeps his reputation as a solid performer, even though he's only working half the hours of his coworkers. Now, we both know that Mike would never agree to this and would not like it if he found out about it. But in truth, he and the entire team are benefiting massively from Tim's focus on leveraging his time and energy and Tim's focus on creating better systems. In fact, Tim's boss repeatedly tells him he's his star performer and wishes he had more workers like him. So let's call this what it is, an elaborate game of smoke and mirrors, a ballet of illusion and perception. This isn't about being dishonest or misleading somebody or being sneaky. It is about being honest with yourself that a big part of succeeding in any work environment is about managing expectations and perceptions. So there you have it. While everyone else is spinning their wheels, you're gonna be working smarter, not harder. Now I want you to pace yourself, implement these strategies, and before you know it, you're gonna be the office productivity ninja. And yes, that same boss you're having conflict with today is going to be your biggest fan tomorrow.